Fallout. Fallout never changes. Except it did. Big time. Before Bethesda and Obsidian got their hands on the IP, the game was developed by Interplay itself. But Black Isle mostly gets the credit for it, even though they mostly only worked on Fallout 2. Released in 1997, it was originally a spiritual successor to Interplay's other CRPG, Wasteland, which came out a decade earlier in 1988. Tim Kane, the creator of Fallout, started developing the idea in 1994 and the game was initially considered a B-tier project for Interplay. They mostly assigned problematic developers to it and it was even almost cancelled a couple of times. The faith in Fallout wasn't all that high, but boy were they wrong, because right now, 30 years later, it's considered to be the first modern CRPG and the game that set the standard for many decades to come. Not only that, but as you probably know, it even got its own TV show, which you can watch right now. If you want to hear our thoughts on it, we'll have a full season review up this Saturday over on our other channel focused on movies and TV called Retro Rewind. So now that we're in Fallout week with the TV show launching and Maddie going back to New Vegas, I was very excited to finally get back to Fallout 1. Voltec, the Pip Boy, Vats, the Brotherhood of Steel, Nuka Cola, Stimpak, Super Mutants, the Mysterious Stranger, Dogmeat, Ghouls, the NCR. This is where it all began. The very first thing we see when we start up the game is our beloved Volt Boy locking himself to safety in Volt 13. We then hear an extremely young Ron Perlman explain to us that after decades of tension, the Sino-American War, which was all about the planet's resources, started in 2066, when China successfully invaded Alaska and ended in a Great War which only took one day. On October 23, 2077, the world became a nuclear wasteland after both China and the US nuked each other to literal hell. A small part of the population locked themselves into the Voltec vaults and almost 100 years later, in 2161, is where we find our protagonist, a resident of Vault 13. Now, upon starting the game, we immediately get presented with the special rule set. This is an acronym for the primary statistics you can allocate points to. You also find these in a lot of modern RPGs, but there these parameters don't really mean all that much anymore. In Fallout, however, they're everything. If you look to the right of the screen, you'll see they have a direct impact on the various skills you can use. For instance, lowering luck will lower your gambling skills, low strength means you can't carry as much, and low intelligence means that you're basically a dumbass, and then conversations will look like this. Have you found the chip? Oh, that's great. Can I have the chip, please? No, not that. I want the computer chip. No, the chip. Just give me the chip! So unlike most modern games, in Fallout 1 you really have to think about what kind of character you want to play beforehand. There's essentially three paths you can take. Action, talking, or stealth. The game even made it possible to have a complete pacifist run where you don't kill anyone, although Tim Kane later confirmed that this was mostly implemented on accident, like many other elements of the game. You also get to tag three skills you're more proficient at than the rest, and pick optional traits, which all have their positives and negatives. Personally, I always go for Bloody Mess, since that's such a fun one. Now, as we start the game, there's no huge sprawling intro or epic vault opening. We're just met with a cutscene of the Overseer telling us Vault 13's water chip broke down and we're sent out into the world to find a replacement. We've got 150 days to do this before the vault runs out of water, everyone dies and the game is over. That's right, Fallout 1 is on a time limit, and if we don't find the water chip within those 150 days, the game effectively ends. Now we can prolong this by finding water merchants along the way to send water back to the vault, but the time limit is still there. And that's it, that's the entire setup of the game. Here's a gun, you're good to go. Now there's of course a whole lot more to the story besides this water chip. As you traverse the wasteland, you'll get into contact with all the groups we've come to know and love. Well, well that's, I guess that's debatable. Um, but they're here, like the totally not totalitarian fun-loving fellas of the Brotherhood of Steel who in this game are more isolationist freaks than anything else. They keep their cards close to the chest in this game. After you find the chip, there's also a whole other main quest revolving around the super mutants, but I won't say anything more about that. Now, as you can see, the game is a bit of a pixel hunt. From this top-down perspective, you get an overview of most of the playable area, but there's no way to highlight what you can click on, so you just have to hover over items with the mouse to see if you can interact with them. 
The inventory itself is also very archaic. You have to manually drag every item you want to loot or use in your two equipment slots. As we're in the Vault Cave and start our first combat with a couple of rats here, the Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System, or VAS, comes into play for the first time. You'll of course know this system from every other Fallout game, and it's essentially a turn-based action point system where you have a predetermined set of points, depending on your agility skill, which you can then use to move, shoot, reload, or open up your inventory. These reds are easy to kill of course, but we'll get to some tougher enemies later on, where we'll go a little more in-depth with the VAT system. Traveling on the world map is pretty simple, you just click where you want to go and you're off. Discovered cities and settlements are already marked on the map, but you will get attacked when traveling there by all sorts of creatures. The first settlement after leaving the vault that we get to is Shady Sands. This seems like your regular old starter town, and it is in Fallout 1. It is here where we meet Eridesh and his daughter Tandy, as well as Ian, our very first companion in the Fallout universe. As you can see, most of the dialogue in the game is text-based, which is presented in a separate window, but the more important NPCs are all voiced and have their own avatar windows with animated sequences. This is where the huge importance of the skills we picked already comes into play, because Ian will initially ask for 100 caps to accompany us, which we obviously don't have at this point in the game yet. However, if our intelligence is at 6 or above, which it is, we should be able to pass the speech check and we can just tell him he'll get a piece of the action. And there you have it, Ian is our first companion. Companions in Fallout 1 are extremely bare bones and were really a bit of an afterthought put into the game at the very end of the development cycle. They don't have their own quests, they hardly ever comment on anything except for a few locations here or there, and most of the time they get in the way or even accidentally shoot you during combat. You can give them a couple of commands like stick close or choose your best weapon, but that's about it. The funny thing is you can trade with them, but they require money unless you literally steal it off of them or you put it in their pocket. To steal something, we click on a skill dex on the lower side of the screen, which holds the skills we can use in the game, but we'll have to use all of them manually. As you can see here, we can just steal all of Ian's items and he won't even comment on it. Eridesh, the leader of this little settlement, will give us a typical starter quest where you have to take on some rat scorpions in a nearby cave. But as you can see, the quest information itself is once again very bare bones. And we've got a question about this from our Patreon. Mike Poe writes in and he asks, how is the writing in Fallout 1? I think with some of these older games, the writing needs to be strong enough to counter how dated the gameplay and graphics are. Do you feel that is the case here? Well, I would say that the lore mostly holds up incredibly well here, and the gameplay. It's not that the writing is bad, far from it even, but the way it's displayed doesn't give enough room for a lot of exposition. There are characters later on with bigger personalities like Gizmo and more things to say, but you'll never truly get to know them like you do in the other games. They also don't really have that much character development, although you can lie to them and if they find out they'll remember that or even attack you. Fallout 1 is the start of it all, so it's easy to forgive, but the writing itself is something that was hugely improved in Fallout 2. There's also a lot less humor or pop culture references in Fallout 1. That became more of a staple with, of the series with 2 and New Vegas. Fallout 1 is as post-apocalyptic as it gets, from the sense of dread to the mostly violent characters you meet, and it's even felt in the music. No fun radio stations or upbeat songs, the soundtrack is mostly filled with dread and despair, which really adds to the atmosphere. As we get to the Red Scorpion Cave, we've got one more question from one of our Patreons, and Straw Hat Ninja asks, As someone who started with 3, but loves tactics, would this be something you recommend I can go back to even with newer tactics games? Yes, definitely. And the reason behind that is VATS. This combat system just works so well. Now as we take out these scorpions with Ian, you'll see that we'll be able to aim for different body parts, like their heads, which does more damage. Later on, when you get better weapons, like rifles, you can even take them out from much further away and they'll never even see you coming. Newer tactics games, of course, improved on this system, but it's still mostly the same in every game. This is why it holds up so well, and apart from the graphics, hasn't really aged. After we take out the scorpions and return to Eridesh, he'll open up a bit more. Now I'll keep this video as spoiler free as I possibly can, but there is one thing I do want to highlight here because it holds such importance for the next Fallout games, and signifies how much of an impact Fallout 1 has on the overall lore. If you don't want to hear this endgame spoiler, which also briefly appears in the show, just skip ahead 20 seconds, I promise this will be the only time we'll do this in this video. At the end of the game, when you watch the end slides of what happened to the people you've met during your wasteland journey, it turns out that Eridesh and Tandy are the founders of the NCR, which later appears in Fallout 2 and New Vegas. Shady Sands basically becomes the first capital of the NCR. Again, 
Fallout 1 laid the groundwork for every game following in it. Not just in broad strokes, but also in the little details with huge consequences for the overall lore later on. Now like I said, no more spoilers, but the game is filled with moments like this and you'll appreciate them even more if you've played the later Fallout games. I want to show you one more companion and an example of the deep mechanics and importance to the lore Fallout 1 holds. When you get to Junktown, one of the little cities in the game, you'll be met by Phil, who asks you to get rid of the dog in front of his door. Now there's two ways we can handle this. You can feed the dog some iguana bits and he'll move away, but if we listen to what Phil said, he mentioned that the previous owner wore a black leather jacket. So if we put on a black leather jacket, the dog will immediately start following us. Now as you might already suspect of course, this isn't just a regular dog, but our good old friend Dogmeat, who appears in every game. It's not the same dog of course, but you know what I mean. This once again shows how deep the mechanics in Fallout run if you just pay attention to the dialogue, environment and what's presented to you. You don't get pointers, tips or hints, you actually have to play the game and pay attention to it, which is something most modern games can learn a thing or two from. Another example of this are the items we find in the world. For instance, there's this elevator shaft to Vault 15, but we get a message that we can't descend without a rope. So once we find a rope and attach it to the shaft, we're good to go. Again, there's no quest or pointer telling you to do this. The quest journal you have inside the Pig Boy is also extremely minimalistic, only presenting you with the quest objective, so it's just an intuitive system you have to actually pay attention to. Which brings us to two questions from our Patreons, which we'll handle at the same time. Now Ben is Handsome and John W. Torres basically ask the same thing. They ask, is there a feature or gameplay mechanic from Fallout 1 that you would like to see integrated into a future mainline Fallout game? Personally, I'm rooting for another tactics, turn-based style entry into the series. I would adore a new isometric Fallout game because I think it serves the series best. Don't get me wrong, I also love the 3D games, but the first two Fallout games let you use your imagination. They let you solve quests in your own way and give you more possibilities to surprise you as a gamer. A 2D game like this inevitably gives you more options to play around with, since programming all the consequences is probably much easier than having a full-fledged 3D cinematic counterpart. Realistically, of course, we'll never get a new isometric Fallout game, I know that, sadly. But there is Wasteland 3, which is absolutely amazing and I can't recommend enough. The turn-based system works so well in that one as well, and the way you can have a direct impact on how the quests, companions and overall story turn out is simply immaculate. In a lot of ways, Wasteland 3 is the original Fallout 3 game we never got called Van Buren. There's even a few direct references to it. So to answer both questions, I would bring over the isometric perspective and the turn-based tactic style gameplay in a heartbeat. I love it. We've got one more question from Addy Holick who asks, For someone who wants to play this game and has never really played a type of game like this before, what sort of advice would you give them? Is there any mods to make the experience better? Now, Fallout 1 only ever got one official patch. But to make it run better on Steam, where I bought it, I only downloaded two mods, the unofficial Fallout community patch and the widescreen mod. Other than that, you're good to go. And my advice to you and everybody else would be, give it a chance. I would love to show you more gameplay or more locations from the game, like Necropolis, the City of the Ghouls, or the training settlement simply called The Hub. But it's such a short game, you can complete it in 20 to 30 hours, that I really don't want to risk you getting spoiled. Especially not with the TV show being out right now, which admittedly borrows most of it from the Bethesda Fallout games, but there are some cool little lore bits you'll recognize from Fallout 1. I will say, however, that Fallout 1 holds up incredibly well. There are, of course, a lot of quality of life improvements missing that you'll find in later games, like looting everything all at once instead of item per item, but apart from that, the atmosphere, gameplay and lore hold up so incredibly well. Even if you're just mildly interested, just give it a go. You can find it pretty cheap on GOG or Steam these days, but there are also physical copies out in the wild. Sadly, I don't have a lot of space to buy physical games anymore, but I do have a friend who does and would like to show you something. All right, here we have a half complete box copy of Fallout on PC. The reason I say half is there is a big box version. It's over $300. We're kind of on a budget here, so I tried to do a compromise and I'll get into how that almost I guess epically failed but for now let's analyze the case shall we so we have the beautiful cover art here m for mature 
wonderful power armor on the back here a little bit of square enix energy if you've been watching all of our complete and box experience you know that square enix has this very confident approach where they just don't tell you anything about the game and you're about to see that here but for a little pc rpg called fallout like here on the left side they go over all of the system requirements for the game itself windows 95 direct x 3.0 you love to see it right and then here on the right side they say as you can see me in the reflection here it's really tough to record this without that so i apologize but you see here it says our existence a subterranean fallout shelter modified to house 1000 people indefinitely after a nuclear holocaust it's been nearly 80 years and we still don't have any idea what's out there sure we've sent out volunteer scouts but none of them have returned now our water recycler has failed. Rationing has begun, but someone needs to leave this vault to get a replacement microchip for the water recycler and look for other survivors. We drew straws. You drew the short one. Ain't that the truth when you beat the game? And then here on the inside, you have a wonderful looking disc art. You also have the manual question mark. It's just a little slip here. You know, I get it. Big box comes with the manual separately, but as you'll see here, just some troubleshooting options. So yeah, you get some cool art, you get the disc, and uh, this is what $50 in the uh, the PC community gets you nowadays. So a very unfortunate complete in box copy of Fallout 1. On a personal level, I love CRPGs, adore them even. Baldur's Gate 2 is my favorite game of all time, and I'm so glad the genre is experiencing a bit of a renaissance lately with the Pathfinder games, the Pillar series, Disco Elysium, Tyranny, Unreal, and of course Wasteland 2 and 3, the list goes on and on, and that's without even mentioning the obvious Baldur's Gate 3. What I love most about these games is the sense of exploration, the feeling that anything could happen at any moment, the multiple ways you can solve quests or interact with people, the way you get to know them and can even recruit some of them as your companions. There were of course CRPGs before Fallout, like Ultima, Wizardry, Might and Magic or Lands of Lore, but the modern, isometric template that we still use to this day started right here with Fallout 1. I initially thought it wouldn't age as well as it did, but I was so happy to be proven wrong. I honestly can't wait to replay Fallout 2 now, or Wasteland 3, I've been dying to get back to that one. If you made it this far and didn't know much about the older Fallout games, I hope I've been able to convince you to give them a try at least, or if they're too archaic for you, which is completely understandable, give Wasteland 3 a look. If you're into post-apocalyptic RPGs, there's a good chance you'll find something special here for you. Now as we've mentioned a couple of times, the Fallout TV show is out and it's really great. I'll be talking about it with Maddie on Saturday and we'll upload our full season review over on Retro Rewind. So I hope to see you there, but otherwise, I'll see you right here next week, my friends. Have a fantastic day.